This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in Good morning, church family. Got a few quick announcements for you this morning. Oh, wait a minute. Here we go. Almost all of the announcements are going to be on the back of the bulletin. So if you don't catch anything or need to double check, you can find it there. As far as events coming up, we got our young adults meeting coming up here. If you would like more information regarding that, please check with either Tim or Nick Rawls and they can uh, get you the information that you need. For those of you who are interested in some apologetics training, a reminder there is that Right to Life workshop coming up on the 26th in Avila. I believe there's a $5 cost for that. There's more information on that event uh, on the Welcome Center downstairs. As far as midweek ministries, we've got the bus stop ministry on Wednesday as normal, praise team practice as normal on Wednesday. The Thursday night Bible study has come to an end, uh, but most everything else should be the same. We want to thank you for your prayers, for safe travels, and for successful hunting. Church family, we'll see you next week. Blessings. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Some wandered into desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Father, you are truly an awesome God. And Father, you do save us from our times of trouble, and you are steadfast and steady, and you never waver. And Father, you never turn away anybody that uh, is in trouble or is in need of salvation. Uh, Father, I can attest to, my, as to myself, Father, that you have uh, drugged me out of the depths of alcoholism and drug abuse and Father, you have placed me in a wonderful church with wonderful people. Father, I do not know where I would be without your steadfast love and your guidance. And uh, Father, I'm just ever thankful for that. And we just thank you this morning, Father, for your endurance and uh, your, the way you love us and care for us, Father, every day. It is truly amazing. And Father, we love you this morning. And uh, Father, we just pray that all that we do and say here this morning is in honoring of you. And uh, bless those that are uh, down in Wyoming hunting, and uh, Father, keep them safe, and may they uh, come back with a bounty. We thank you for the amen, and uh, just again, Father, we are very thankful for your love and, and, and steadfastness. In Christ's name we pray. All right, uh, greet one another. <laughs> So are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. The Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory.
Turn to 293, Amazing Grace. Well, good morning. I am Kerry Goodrich, and for those of you who do not know me, I am uh, setting in for Ben today. Ben is out in Wyoming uh, enjoying the beauty of God's creation, to be honest with you. Um, ben is not hunting this year, but he is helping others to, uh, in a service-oriented direction, I believe, and he's having a good time while he's doing it. Um, if you are new, there is a card on the back of the pew, a visitor's card, if you would fill it out, please, and uh, put it in the offering. That would be awesome. If you're online and you would be interested, uh, leave a message online, and uh, we will get back with you as need be. We were at a point in John that is just on the verge of being a turning point. Up to this point, everything that's been said has been... God's leadership and his direction to Jesus on healing, um, the, the speaking to the 5,000. Um, it's, it's been a busy time in, in Jesus' life in his three-year um, missions that he has been given to him. And at every point that the religious leaders thought that they were going to get a hold of him, Jesus disappeared, whether it's a miracle or Jesus knew where the back door was out, I can't attest to it, but he always made the statement, my time is not at hand. And where I'm at today will lead you just about to the point of where some Greeks show up into the next section starting in 20, and you get the feeling that Jesus is on borrowed time. So that's where I'm going to start at today, and, and what I'm going to do is John um, 12, 1 through 19. And I'm going to work more on the characters today than I am the anointing by Mary. Um, 
I'm sure you've all heard Mary's story a thousand times and you've heard Judas's probably another thousand times. Um, when I started looking into this, I wrote it and then I promptly tore it up. So this thing has been written three times. Um, I hope that you take something out of it. Um, if we can, do you have it? Evelyn, do you have the verse today for the focus? Okay. Uh, will you please read this along with me? For I have given you an example that you shall also do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than one. Right. And that would be John 13, 15, and 16. And we're going to leave it alone at that. Today's reading comes out of uh, John 12, 1 through 19. And I am going to read that out of the Bible. So bear with me today, please. Uh, if you're interested in it, you can find it in the Pew Bible. Oops, I believe it's on uh, 990, 975 or 995 if you'd like to look up John in the, in the Pew Bible. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one who was reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. <clears throat> when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom, they had risen, whom he had risen from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took the branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not! daughter of Zion behold your king is coming sitting on a donkey sitting on a donkey's colt his disciples did not understand these things at first but when Jesus was glorified then they remembered these things that had been around him and that had been done to him the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard about the sign that he had done so the Pharisees said to one another you see, that the, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. And I love that part because that is almost, no, that's not almost, that is a prophecy. Um, it's said by somebody that does not believe in Jesus, but it's a whole lot like um, John 11 and uh, 50, it would be 50. Nor do you understand that it is better for that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. And again, uh, that was um, the, the head chief priest that said that. So God is using them in a way that they never suspected, and which is um, pretty awesome when you see God do that. So as we look at chapter 12 today, um, we are coming to the last Old Testament Sabbath of the, co of the Old Covenant. On Friday, Jesus dies, thus ratifying the New Covenant. What we begin to see is God's plan, the division of two peoples brought about by Jesus' teaching over the last three years. The very strong faith of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, and the very hatred of Judas, the high priest, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. Then you have those that are not sure where they stand. One moment crying, Hosanna, then the next crying, crucify him. If I've honored, it looks a bit like this in our world today. We have Marthas, 
Judas's, hostile leaders, and many indifferent folks that just won't take a stand one way or the other until it just depends on what side or who they're talking with. So again, I'd like to look at the individuals in verses 1 through 19. Um, so Jesus is returning from Ephraim, and he's chose to stay the night with close friends. Can you imagine what was on Jesus' mind just six days before he's, his known death for our sins? Was he thinking about the betrayal? Maybe the kangaroo court that they were going to put him through. The beatings? His hands and feet being pierced? The suffocation upon the cross? And worst of all, his father turning his back on him. When I think about that, it kind of gives me chills because he was in a really, really lonely spot right now. So it was good to have been around friends. So, and, and yet, you know, he made the time to spend time with close friends and enjoy the meal with them. I would be a bit remiss if I failed to tell you where this meal took place because John really doesn't talk about it. Um, but in Matthew 26, 6, we see that the meal was prepared in the home of Simon the leper. And if you heard my voice carry a little bit, you heard me, you know, my mind tends to go multiple directions. But my first thought is, is why would Simon the leper be giving a meal at his place if he had leprosy? Because he was unclean and he would have been banished probably a remote island somewhere. So as I talked with the children and as I thought about this, there, there's really only a couple of options. And one is there are times in the in the... Uh, history books that they talk about somebody that had leprosy that it just the body healed itself and the other response to that that I thought of is somewhere along the line Jesus had met Simon and he was the recipient of one of his miracles so he was clean and and uh, as I led that on um, I had to think that um, Jesus did not become unclean by associating with Simon but Simon became clean by the association with Jesus. Much like, the, much like the rest of us, we all were unclean prior to meeting with Jesus. Now note how welcome Jesus was in the home of Simon the leper. No doubt he at times grew weary and looked forward to these times of peace and quiet. Here is a place where Jesus was truly honored as guest. As I thought of this hospitality, I wondered how welcome Jesus would be in our homes. He knows our history. Could he sit and watch the same TV shows that we watch? Would our attitudes offend him? Could he look in any cupboard, any cabinet, any drawer that he choose to without fear of us of him finding something that we didn't want him to see? Could he go into any room? Honoring Jesus in our home's husbands means treating your wife with the love and respect she is due. She is a gift of God. Honoring Jesus in our home's wives means loving your husband as scripture teaches. It does not mean being treated as a doormat, but instead being a partner. It means showing him respect. In both cases, if you are going to love Jesus, you have to love him from your heart. The first individual we see at the meal is Martha. Martha is a practical type of person, and she enjoys working very much with her hands. And I like Martha because I'm a whole lot like her um, in my, where the gifts that I have been given and the things that I don't mind doing that other people hate. This is kind of where I sit most of the time. I don't mind being service-oriented and working in the background. But regardless, this is a gift of God. She's in a service industry of gathering, preparing, and serving. Service in the New Testament is a highly valued need. A very important part of the early church. In the book of Acts, we read of the people who served the church. In Romans 16, it talks about all the men and women who served with Paul. Trust me when I say, this is a gift, a great way to honor Jesus. Luke 22, 27 states, I am among you as one who serves. In Luke 12, 37, we read, Blessed are the servants who, when the master finds who the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself and serve and have them recline at his table, and he will come and serve them. In Acts 20, 19 through 20, we see Paul serving the Lord with all humility, with tears 
and with trials that happened to him through the plots of the Jews, how he did not shrink from declaring anything that was profitable for God and teaching in the public and from house to house. Genesis 5.13, but love, but through love, serve one another. Now we come to Lazarus. And you remember Lazarus spent four days in the tomb and Jesus showed up. And because of the faith that Martha and Mary showed with their understanding of Jesus and what he was capable of doing, Jesus raised him from the dead. So you've got him sitting here and he's having a conversation with the disciples and with Jesus and with Simon. Um, so I can only imagine the conversation that took place and, and I won't regale you with all the places that my mind went, but the thing that I settled on was how do we spend our time in the presence of God? Um, not being corporate, not in a small group, just you and God, and not talking to God, but talking with God. Lazarus was practicing, practicing what many of us neglect, fellowship with Jesus, talking with, asking questions, and listening to what Jesus had to say. This should be something we desire, to sit quietly in his presence. There are times we must discipline ourselves to shut out all the clutter and clamor of this world. There is no substitute for enjoying the presence of the Lord. Psalm 1611 states, in your presence there is fullness of joy. James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And this brings us to Mary. <clears throat> in John 12, 3, we read, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. I wonder, was Mary to a point, I mean, if you think about Mary and an earlier meal that she had with Mary, or with Jesus, and she was, Martha was a little flustered. And Jesus just basically said, leave Mary alone. She is here, she's listening, she's learning. And I wonder how often that happened with Mary as she grew in her knowledge of Jesus because I don't know how else she could have done what she's done without growth. Growth. I know it's a gift, and I know some of us come across it a whole lot quicker than others do. And I am not at this point yet where I am comfortable with doing that. But I wonder, was she aware of what was going to happen to Jesus? Had she figured out what the disciples had not? I'd like to put you at the supper. And I'm sorry if you can't do this, but my mind wanders. And, and I can see at this point now, I can see a U-shaped table. And I can see the 12 disciples. I can see Simon. I can see Jesus. I can see Lazarus. And can you see Mary coming from the corner of the room? And she breaks the jar of nard. And she sits at Jesus' feet. And she pours this jar of nard all over his feet, and then she drops her hair. And, and I say that because that was not Hoyle in Mary's time. You just did not leave your hair hang. The only time you did that is in the house and in the privacy with your husband. So you see another part of Mary here that if you really don't dig, you don't understand the chance that she took when she did this. Do you see the look on the face of all that sat around the table? Is there shock, dismay, maybe even terror as they watch Mary pour this expensive nard all over? And I think probably the room was dead quiet as they all looked around to see what Jesus' reaction would be. She's showing humility sitting at Jesus' feet, doing the job of a slave. And I thought of the statement that John the Baptist made. He must increase and I must decrease. As I grow deeper in the scripture and as I spend more time in it, I believe with all my heart that when we come to know Jesus for who he really is, it'll humble us. Coming to know him will be no ordinary thing. The better we know him, the more personal, the more intimate, the more humbling our worship experience will be. Mary isn't concerned about being criticized for using a very expensive jar. Yeah, Mary isn't. 
Mary isn't concerned about being criticized for using a very expensive jar of nard or acting the part of a slave or letting her hair down in public or as it's going to come being criticized by Judas. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that when you feel led to worship from your heart, there will always be somebody who doesn't understand. They may give you that look that says, wow, what planet are you from? You realize you're wasting your life here. Nobody believes that anymore. But you know, you can't, you can't let that stop you. Worship is for one audience and one alone. And that audience is Jesus. Worship is the praise of the saints to the one who made us holy. It is something we do for God's pleasure without regard of what others think of us. Mary doesn't care how public it is, how much privacy she's had, how much it might humiliate her. She is there only to honor Jesus. This is what I love about Mary, and if I'm honest, something that I totally fail out. When the opportunity arises, no matter where it's at or what time it is, we need to be a bit more like Mary. Folks, I believe that God wants us to worship, wants our worship to be spontaneous at times. He wants us to be passionate about honoring him. I believe that which comes as a natural response of our love for him is usually the most heartfelt. Mary's deed was both authentic and heartfelt. Mary was worshiping Jesus for who he was and what he had done, and probably for what he was going to do. And now the Bible takes a bit of a turn. And I love this because John is looking back. He has that privilege of having 20-20 vision. And, and one of the things that really gets me is when he talks about the perfume the nard and the way it spread throughout the house. Again, I can almost see John closing his eyes and he can still smell that perfume. And that tells me that he really, really is into this part of the story and into telling us the turn that's going to take place in the next chapter. So Joseph, or so Judas is strictly the polar opposite of Judas. Mary was overflowing with sacrificial love. Judas, on the other hand, was full of greed. He was bitter and full of hatred. Maybe a bit jealous of Mary's anointing of Jesus and his feet. Judas' only words in the entire Bible are inflammatory. Verse 12, 5 reads, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And on the surface, this looks like he really had some concern that he really would like to have seen this spent. But at the same time, it almost feels to me like he's taking a shot at Mary and he's taking a shot at Jesus. He's telling her that isn't worth putting there. And he's telling Jesus, you aren't worth putting that oil on your feet. So underneath, there's a very evil intent here. And Jesus, or Judas's only intent was on himself. Folks, I, if you are following the guidance of the Holy Spirit, there will almost always be a Judas standing around and telling you, that's a dumb idea. Or, here, this is a better investment. And why are you still working with the church? I'm amazed that Judas, is, that I'm amazed that Judas knew the price of the nard, but not the value of his content at this point. The tale in verse 3 tells that the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume Mary had anointed Jesus' feet with. The poison of Judas's words turned the event toxic and contaminated the air. In verse 8, we see Jesus speaking, For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. What I read in this and what I think the point is for me is we should be very generous to God and don't let the critics tell us it's not a worthy cause or a good investment. We worship when we serve. We worship when we spend time in his presence. We worship when we honor Jesus. Do you see the hand of God in this? When Jesus um, says, leave her alone, Judas is broken and looking for vengeance. God knew from the very beginning Judas would turn on Jesus. 
Jesus, Jesus is going to the cross. For us, God will make something very bad become something very, very good. God will work all things out to his glory. You're at the point now where things are just about to finish up in, in the section that I have got. We've got three more groups to talk about. And verse 9 speaks of those that were witness to the miracles that Jesus had performed. <coughs> and many of them turned to Jesus in his belief, and they believed in him. And it speaks to that here. Um, verse 9, we see a large group of Jews who come to see Jesus, the one who raised Lazarus, and Lazarus, the one whom Jesus raised. And scripture tells us many in this group came to believe in Jesus. The second group is found in verse 12. They met Jesus as he entered Jerusalem with palm branches and shouting, Hosanna. This same group, a bit later, that, like Judas, decided Jesus was not who they thought he was. Now they're shouting, crucify him. We have no need for him. Once again, they totally missed the point of who Jesus was. He rode in on a young donkey, a beast of humble origins, not on a war horse, not carrying a sword, they misunderstood the signs Jesus had performed. They wanted an earthly savior, immediate gratification. Not an eternal savior full of grace and mercy. Which brings us to the last group, the religious leaders. In verse 53, we see that the high priest called the council together and decided Jesus must die. It is better for one to die that all may live. And in verse 11 of chapter 12, now the same council has decided that Lazarus is to die as well. And I ask myself, why? And, you know, all on the surface, it's, it's pretty simple. It's because many were leaving and following Jesus. But there's a couple points here that I want to bring out. Because it says, because many are going away. And if you haven't asked yourself, where are they going? Where are they leaving? Um, you have to put yourself, I guess, in the council's position because they are losing people who have been there their whole life. So what they're going to lose is they're going to lose the temple. They're going to lose the people that have had the Jewish religion their entire life. And if this happens and if they continue to follow Jesus there's no more old covenant there's no use for the priests in the old covenant there's no more sacrifices the priests will lose their power over the people and their authority as well second with Lazarus gone there is no proof of a resurrection the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection Lazarus was a living proof that their teaching was wrong it made them fallible, capable of making mistakes. It made their teaching false. We have the privilege of 2020 vision looking back. But I still, I still got to wonder, what were they thinking? They couldn't deny the resurrection or many of the signs that, that Jesus had performed because there were too many witnesses. They couldn't kill all of them. And it would do no good to remove the evidence because... Um, Think about it. If they killed Lazarus again, Jesus is still walking this earth. What's going to prevent him from bringing Lazarus back to life again? So, you know, you think about this. How many times can they kill Lazarus and how many times can Jesus bring him back? This is, this is going to backfire on him big time. And, you know, you think about it. After all, up to this point, they were not even able to kill Jesus. In this chapter, Jesus doesn't say much. He is almost a secondary character. But when he spoke, it determined his fate. In verse 7, he drops the boom on Judas. Three little words. Leave her alone. Even if it was spoke in love and quietly, it leveled Judas's pride. 
what I do see is God's protection if we honor and worship him. Every time we read Matthew 26, 13, we are reminded of this. Wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in her memory. And I like that very much because it is a true reminder that God is always going to be with us. It's us that chooses to walk away from him. That there should be no fear in standing our ground. So it made me think, what is our legacy going to be? Does Jesus get the glory and the honor from our life? Is he honored in our home? What we read, what we watch, what we listen to? Do we honor him from our hearts? Do we give more than expected? Are we preoccupied with the idea that Jesus is to be exalted through every aspect of our life? And I'm reminded too through this and some of the other scripture that I read this week that God is always going to leave a remnant. And I'm very thankful for that. Let us pray. Father, I so enjoy spending time in your scripture, and I apologize for not spending the time that I should, not digging as deep as I should. And I haven't realized that until you put me up here behind the pulpit. But I love the reactions to all involved with Jesus. And I see their heart involved in it, and I see the direction that it turned. I see those who are not sure that are not sure where to turn. And God, that's where we come in. That's where the evangelism, the discipleship, the relationships come in. And I'm grateful for these when you provide them. And I apologize for when I walk away from them and don't see them. I do continue to pray for those who are on vacation. Look after them, keep them safe, provide for them and bring them back safely, please. I think of those who uh, have been injured who have had surgery and are healing. I thank you for your hand of protection upon them and for the hand upon those who have done the surgery. I pray for the hunters, look after them. I pray for the farmers. They're a busy lot this time of year. Be an encouragement and a blessing to them. We all look to you for our future, for our salvation. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father God, you are an awesome, holy God. And as we have come here to bring you our praises, I pray that you hear them. The songs we sing, I pray that it pleases you as we sing them. Father God, you are creator of all things and provider for us. And we thank you for it. We thank you, Jesus, for your saving grace that you so willingly went to the cross for us, that your blood would, sh would wash us clean of all of our sins. We are heartily sorry of them and sincerely repent of them. And Father, we pray that you not look, look upon us as sinners, but as your, as your redeemed sons and daughters. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for guiding us through this week and pray that you continue to be our comfort and guide through, uh, through the next week until we meet again. We thank you, Spirit, for your energy and, and understanding that we, might, that we might come to a fuller understanding of your word. And even as we cannot understand it all, we pray for the faith that grants us the ability to accept it as truth. Father God, we pray. 
your spirit to, to continue to guide this church in its endeavors to reach out to the, con to the community as we continue to pray for those other uh, missions that are supporting your word for Miracle Tree and for Inspiration Ministries, Noble House, likewise Academy. Father, we pray for our neighboring and sister churches that the word and energy in, in uh, trying to reach the more people would be blessed. Let their work not be in vain. We pray for our local schools, Father, that your, your influence may, may continue to increase. That the Pray for our teachers that as they try to guide the minds of these young people, it would be to your pleasure and your, your will. We pray for your guidance. That we will walk in the paths that you have laid out for each of us as we try to continue uh, in our own ministry that you have uh, given to us. I pray for your blessings on them. God, and direct us as we move into this next week. We give you all the praise in your son's name. Amen. Kingdom authority Flow from his throne